Okay. We're recording. Okay, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Adult Forum with Mother Cameron and Father Stephen. Hi. Glad you all could join us today. We're going to be talking about awe, awe and wonder and the fear of the Lord and things that are awful and dreadful and what that really is all about. Yes. So, so um, as you all know, each week we have um, a article that comes from the Wired Word. And so um, this month there um, was an article about the necessity of awe among scientists uh, with long held understandings of the world as shown to be flawed. Uh, reminds us how, how often the Bible mentions awe um, as a response to God and to things of God. Um, so today we have an article entitled, Awe is Essential for Scientific Progress, Professor Says. So um, here's our article for today. When a long accepted explanation of how the world works breaks down or is shown to be flawed, the emotion that most helps scientists delve further and leap into the unknown is awe. That's the claim of Helen de Cruz, professor of philosophy and humanities at St. Louis University in Missouri. Her article on the subject of awe was published this month at Aeon, a non-for-profit website committed to the spread of knowledge and serious thinking. Those long accepted explanations are known in scientific jargon as paradigms. A paradigm is a distinct set of concepts and practices that define a scientific discipline at any particular period of time. When a paradigm is shown to be untenable, it's nothing short of a scientific revolution. A paradigm shift is when old established theories collapse and new ideas and understandings take their place. Awe increases our tolerance for uncertainty and opens our receptivity to new and unusual ideas, which are crucial for paradigm change, De Cruz says. Noting that awe is also a spiritual and moral emotion, De Cruz cites the work of others who maintain that all clear cases of awe have two components, an experience of vastness, and a need for mental accommodation to that vastness. Mm. Writing elsewhere, Presbyterian theologian Frederick Buechner, Buechner, Frederick Buechner, yeah. goodness gracious, Frederick Buechner illustrated all by saying, I remember seeing a forest of giant red word. <laughs> I'm suddenly tongue tied. So we're just gonna start that whole sentence over. <laughs> Writing elsewhere, Presbyterian theologian Frederick Buechner illustrated awe by saying, I remember seeing a forest of giant redwoods for the first time. There were some small children nearby, giggling and chattering and pushing each other around. Nobody had to tell them to quiet down as we entered. They quieted down all by themselves. Everybody did. You couldn't hear a sound of any kind. It was like coming into a vast, empty room, or as de Cruz puts it, awe is a self-transcendent emotion because it focuses our attention away from ourselves and toward our environment. She goes on to describe awe, along with curiosity and wonder, as emotions related to the search for knowledge, and says that a person lacking such emotion won't have the drive to become a good scientist. Who can change her mind on the basis of evidence? In telling about the visit to the forest of giant redwoods, Beekner, in effect, described a paradigm shift. Two or three hundred feet high, the redwoods stood. They made you realize that all your life had been mistaken. Oaks and ashes, maples and chestnuts and elms, you had seen for as long as you could remember but never until this moment had you so much as dreamed what a tree really was. Mm -hmm. De Cruz also noted the work of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Herschel, who insisted that awe is critical for not taking the world for granted and thus losing the ability to experience it with depth and reverence. Thus awe is a pathway to not only knowledge, but also to wisdom. The main thrust of de Cruz's article 
was that awe is required not only for the day-to-day -day working of science, but is also crucial to help reorient scientists' thinking in times of paradigm change. But she also acknowledged that the emotional drive for awe is what matters in other fields as well. And it might be, as Herschel speculated, our only path to knowledge and wisdom. So um, one of the Wired Word team members comments, um, to the best of my memory, my first thinking about the word awe occurred as a child after I read something that referred to our awful God. And that sounded wrong to me, so I asked my father, who was a member of the clergy, about it. He explained that the writer was using the word awful in an earlier sense, where it meant awe-inspiring and worthy of awe. The Bible not only pictures God as worthy of awe, but also uses awe and words related to it to name an emotion engendered in human beings as they encounter God. So this lesson will give us a chance to examine and learn um, some of the Bible's uses of awe. Have you ever seen the Big Redwoods? Yes, I have. <gasps> wow. It's just, you know, there are very few um, physical places on this planet that have just overwhelmed me with awe. One is the Grand Canyon. One is the Redwood Forest in California. And the other is Yosemite National Park. I, I, you know, you just stand there and go, how? How is this here? And it, it's just amazing. I love looking out, too, at the night sky when there's no moon. And I can go out away from the light pollution and just stand or lay down and look up at the stars. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me that. Uh, this is just the stars of our solar, our, um, our galaxy. Yeah. And there are hundreds of thousands of other galaxies. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I think this is what um, the Bible is trying to get at by using the word awful, as in full of awe. And we use awful as a, as a bad word. But in some ways, you know, being filled with that much awe is also a, a humbling thing. Mm -hmm could be considered a negative thing because you realize how small and insignificant we are in the grand scheme of the universe. You know, just a speck on this small little planet orbiting this average sized sun in one corner of our galaxy. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it is awful. Well, so I was thinking like awe meaning like filled, like, like being filled with something mm -hmm. and so like awful it's filled with terrible yuckiness right like it's <laughs> and then awesome <laughs> got some awe there you got some awe but you know but like you're like tubular dude like awesome dude like you awesome <laughs> Our and God I say is an awesome, awesome all the time. God. You did an awesome job, right? Like an awesome job. Like awesome is you know full of good things, and then awful being full of ick. So, yeah. um, bearing in mind that meanings of most words tend to drift mm -hmm. um, over time as they are used and misused, um, tell what the following words mean to you. So we just did awful and awesome. What about mm -hmm. awestruck? Awestruck, that's, I, I picture something, a sudden awareness. Mm. Not one that grows on you as you stare up at the night sky, but one that just hits you by surprise. So could you be awestruck in fear or sure. anger? Yeah. Sure. Awestruck in fear, awestruck in, in um, seeing something amazing. So one dictionary definition of awe is a mixed emotion of reverence, respect, dread, and wonder inspired by um, mm -hmm. authority, genius, great beauty, sublimity, or might. Um, as a person of faith, would you add or subtract anything from that definition? No, I think that's, what about you? I think it's a good definition. I, I like it. 
I think it's one, like, I don't know that, that I would add or subtract anything, but I'm definitely thinking about the word, like semantics, I suppose. But, mm -hmm. um, like, it'd totally be one of those words that get people confused when you're learning our language. Mm -hmm. uh. Like, um, there is a comedian um, that does a skit about you know coming to the United States um, and and trying to figure out um, how words work and so you know it's just kind of a funny like okay like well it meant this but now it's bad like you know the good and the bad of of, of different words um, I suddenly realized halfway into that that I can't say those words on this particular stream so um, <laughs> You were kind of like being a smart blank or a bad blank. <laughs> um, which were two different things, right? You being a smart blank, then you, that was not a good thing. But to be a bad blank was a good thing. You're being a- Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard this routine. Yes, so anyway, I might need to cut that out. So- <laughs> No, no, it's good. Well, you know, I once heard a, a Vietnamese um, refugee. He was five or six years old when he was brought to this country. So he grew up here in the United States, but his parents were still very much Vietnamese. And Vietnamese language has no interrogative voice. It can't ask the question, what if? What if this had happened? What if that had happened? What if this will happen? You know, it just has, has no words for that. And so, once he was in college, he was ruminating on the idea of how lucky he was that he made it out of Vietnam and came to this country. And so he asked his parents, what if we didn't get out? What would have happened to us? They had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I mean, we got out. No, what if we didn't? Could you imagine? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and, he, and it came across the realization that you know, language yeah. is different based on culture. Yes. Well, so, I mean, I just try and figure out how, like, you, like, how do you know? Like, I, I think it's that you have to use the other word clues around it, right? Or the person's facial expressions, which is increasingly, you know, to help understand which awful or awesome or awestruck or just plain awe they're talking about, right? Right. So speaking of your what if question, what if any of your, <laughs> so what if any of your experiences of God seem diminished from what they once were because you've come to take them for granted or because they are no longer new to you? Hmm. Uh, that's a very good question. I think most of my profoundest encounters with God still remain extremely, extremely profound. I mean, I, I still remember them. They still fill me with a sense of awe and wonder. Um, yeah. Uh, there are very few that I could say I've gotten used to. I don't, I don't get used to them because when I revisit them, it makes me realize again how humble and lucky I am to exist at all and to uh, be loved by a God who, I believe loves the universe into being. And uh, I think maybe, maybe I'm programmed for awe and wonder. I don't know. I just, I, I just tend to experience a lot. <laughs> well, I wonder like if there are, like for me, I'm thinking that there may be certain things that I become complacent about, right? And then something happens or you see, I see something and I go, oh yeah. In the big scheme of things, this is teensy tiny, and yeah. you know what an aw awesome God we have. <laughs> Our God is an awesome God. <laughs> he reigns. Um, I can sing that. We can sing that song later if you want. Uh, oh, that's so, okay. <laughs> so, um, De Cruz asserts that awe increases our tolerance for uncertainty and opens our receptivity to new and unusual ideas. Um, she's applying that statement to scientific work, but in terms of faith, um, they ask what might it mean for us to be tolerant of uncertainty? Um, and I think that, you know, I think our tolerance, you know, speaking of tolerance, of course, kicks up the, the idea of um,
everything that's happening in our world right now, like, I mean, all the, you know, divisions and protests and that sort of thing. And I don't know that, I don't want to use the word tolerant because I don't think we need, just need to come to tolerate um, no. political divisiveness or that we just need to tolerate um, other races and cultures. I think that, um, however, I think that awe does increase our ability to um, to integrate and welcome things that are different yeah. than ourselves. Well, as the article was saying, it points out that, you know, the old ways of understanding things don't seem to fit anymore. And a new experience makes us realize that, wait a minute, the reality we thought was rock solid is not the, the best description of the universe anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the awe and wonder I felt when I learned from a scientist about the, um, the ultimate end of the theory of relativity by Einstein. Mm -hmm. Is that Einstein was talking about everything in the universe being related to everything else, and even light being bent by gravity. And some of his fellow scientists came up with this idea of, if everything's related like this, what if we create two photons of light in the same explosion, and they're going away from each other at the speed of light and spinning in opposite directions. What happens if we pass one through a magnetic field and reverse its spin the other direction? What will happen to the other one? And they said, well, if they really are related to each other, they would change their spin too. Mm -hmm. How would they know? They would just know. And it led Einstein to say, no, God doesn't play dice with the universe. But in the 70s, they finally built a, a, a particle accelerator collider big enough to prove it. That's what wow. happens. That's what happens. Going away from each other at the speed of light, they change spin at the same time. They just know. They just know. <laughs> what does that say about our universe and how connected we are with everything in it and each other? Yeah. And all this divisiveness that you've talked about is not what we were created to be. Yeah. So they actually, um, each week, they, the Wired Word gives us a number of scriptures to read along with the, um, the lesson and, and, and applying everything. And so one of the ones for today that I wanted to point out was um, Hebrews um, chapter 12. Um, they take out one line, of course. So <laughs> yeah, it comes with that explanation. We're going to explain a little bit. But the verse that they share with us um, is 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. And one of the re previous ones they mentioned was God in the bush, burning bush, and you know the consuming fire that spoke out to Moses. Um, but they point out here that the writer of Hebrews was addressing people who, because of threat of persecution, were drifting away from faith in Christ. The writer sees faith in Christ as a luminous hope and reminds readers that in contrast to the world as they know it, which is shaken by one trouble after another, an unshakable new kingdom is coming, i.e. a paradigm shift. Thus, he calls his readers to offer God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And he bases this awe on the godness of God, whom he here describes as a consuming fire. The writer knows that worship is the means by which the church in its present life draws near to God. Worshipers can approach God with confidence, knowing that in Jesus we will find mercy and grace to help. This understanding, the writer says, should infuse every word and act of worship with gratitude, but never should the worshiper forget that it is God whom we approach and that therefore the service is offered in reverence and awe. Biblical commentator Fred Craddock, one of my favorites, notes that the image, go Fred, um, God um, love his memory, yes, um, notes that the image of God as a consuming fire while jolting and distancing at first, reminds a congregation that has grown neglectful, apathetic, dull of hearing, and indifferent towards its own gatherings, that its life of worship is not to sink into the same clearlessness, 
In fact, may also be understood to imply that designing worship that abandons gratitude, reverence, and awe in order to please passing tastes may meet with some applause, but fail in what is acceptable to God. The Message Bible version renders these two verses this way. Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and won't quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is fire. <laughs> so, Thank you, Eugene Peterson. Yes. So, um, yeah, we got, a, we got a lot of great people in this article today. Beekner oh, yeah. and Craddock and Peterson. Special? Yes. Yeah, all kinds of cool people. So where's the line between fear and awe? Um, that's a really good question. I think true awe will always carry with it some degree of fear. I mean, because one, if it's a paradigm shift, then you know you have to give up the old paradigm and you don't know what's coming. And that can be a source of fear. And for religious awe, that sense of the vastness of the universe and God's creation of it and our tiny, humble part of it, well, there is a fear in acknowledging our tiny, humble part, you know, just, just a small little speck in the midst of it all. So I, I, I think a healthy dose of awe often comes with a healthy, healthy dose of fear. So they talk about um, the ways in which our congregational worship reflect, and that's kind of what Craddock was saying, right? Yeah. Reflect the reverential, reverential elements and seek to appropriately show God's godness. Um, but that at some degree, it can detract from that, right? So, right. Right. Um, well, there's that great quote they have there at the end, toward the end of the article from Annie Dillard. Yes. About what we do with worship. <laughs> what did she have to say about that? Why do people in churches seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on yes. a package tour of the absolute? Of the absolute. <laughs> We're on a package tour of the absolute. <laughs> yeah. On the whole, I do not find Christians outside the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday. Kill a Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> to kill a Sunday. I love that. <laughs> it's the madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. Yeah. <laughs> now that's worship <laughs> that's worship yeah i want to come back to that i want to come back to that because that is truly awe and fear um fear and all but i want to go back to really fast about the idea of what we do in worship so i'm thinking of like drama of the word and drama of the service right, right. so as episcopalians we do have drama mm -hmm. we reserve it for high holy days Right, so like <laughs> during the regular year, we come and we worship and, you know, we've got some candles, we've got a little bowing, it's all very neat and polite, right? Um, whereas some of our other brothers and sisters literally have smoke and mirrors, or there is, uh, we have music, but we aren't dancing and waving hands and clapping on a regular Sunday morning. And, um, and personally, I have... That is not the way I want to worship every Sunday, but I have gone to places like Passion City, which we have talked about a few weeks ago, yeah. um, that has the band and the, you know, flashy lights and that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think there's a time and a place for that. And that is an awesome way to worship sometimes. sometimes. But that for me, that's not the way I want to worship all the time. Um, but in the Episcopal Church, we hold on to this. And I'm sure there are other traditions, potentially Lutheran and Catholic, that do the same thing. We save our drama and awe and fear 
for high holy days. So for example, like Pentecost, when we bring out the big, you know, the ribbons and the, you know, I think of the ribbon bears that come around and, um, you know, swirl, swirl everything and we bring out all the flags and we've got, you know, all the extra stuff. And then like, and Holy Week in particular, right? So like when we talk about what do we do that invokes fear and awe, I remember um, one year I was at a Monday Thursday service and the church had a big back altar and then they had a new altar that had been pulled out, right? So there was a space to walk in between, but everything gets stripped. You've got the lighting that invokes death and despair, right? We've turned off the lights. Everything is stripped away. We're reminded what terrible, awful people we are, that we've killed, you know, we're sending Christ off to his death. And then the priest, as part of cleansing the altar space, had a palm branch that would dip in water and flick onto the altar and the back stone wall. And so you heard this like lashing sound, mm -hmm. right? Of this wet palm yeah. hitting things. Wow. Um, to which at the moment, of course, I was in tears and moved, but I remember questioning at some level, was that manipulative, mm. right? So how much of what we do in worship is worshipful is meant to invoke awe and fear and reverence. And at what point do we decide this is the line of, this is formational and educational and then, and not fire and brimstone. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I mean, anything that touches stuff like this can be manipulated. That's why there's been so many successful hucksters in the church, unfortunately, because you can manipulate this stuff. So that's just the reality. And, you know, we do, we do sometimes take it for granted, though. I mean, you talk about how we, we do this kind of awe and, and amazing stuff at High Holy Days. But, you know, every Sunday we start with that line, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. I mean, if that doesn't want us to lash ourselves to the pews and put on crash helmets, I don't know what would. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we say that every Sunday. Do we really want to know that? Yeah. If that's what God is doing with us the minute we walk in a church. All hearts are open. All desires known. And from God, no secrets are hid. Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Well, we had this psalm the other week of, um, and I've shared this with you before. I, if I go to the tops of the mountains, God, you're there. And if I go to the depths of the oceans, you're going to be there too. And even if I think I have found the darkest, most remotest spot, darn it, God, you're there too. Right? <laughs> Leave me alone, would you? <laughs> yeah, and it's meant to be a comforting psalm, right? right like, right. there's nowhere that you can go without experiencing the love of God. God will be with you no matter where you are. And then there are some times where you're like, God, I'm really trying to get away from you, and darn it all, you keep following me no matter where I go. <laughs> no matter where I go. <laughs> That's right. So I want to go back to kind of what you were talking about, like, you know, with that opening prayer of do we, t if we take these words seriously about what they're talking about, mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? And I think Annie Dilliard does totally touch on that, right? So um, I'm going to read you her quote one more time. Um, it's from her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk, um, that she raised the issue of what to expect, expect when gathered in the presence of God when she penned the following. Why do people in churches seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a packaged tour of the absolute? On the whole, I do not find Christians outside the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. 
we should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should be issued life preservers and signal failures. They should lash us to our pews. And that is that kind of awe and wonder that if we were to take our faith deeply seriously, like what the, the um, Bible says and these stories that we read that are part of our tradition and what we are called to do, dressed up in my Sunday best with my little white gloves and my little straw hat is not going to prepare me for that right? Like, she's like, if you're going to take this seriously, you've got to be armored up. Because <laughs> a whole lot of stuff's fixing to come flying at you. Yeah. And you're going into dangerous places, right? Like, mm -hmm. ju in that you're being, you're going against the grain, you're going against the norm. And yeah. to follow Christ is to, as the uh, initial apostles and disciples knew, to risk your life. Yeah, I just. This, this is about giving our lives over. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it is fearful and awe filled. Well, you've shared the story multiple times about um, Victoria Lewis, right? And, yeah. um, and she knows that we share the story all the time, just because right, right. it was a great example about you know, I want to celebrate communion too. And are you willing to have the rope tied around your ankle? Yeah. Because you, well, it's your story. So you finish it. Well, yeah. When, when Victoria was a senior in high school, she wanted to say the Eucharist at the altar. And I said, this is about going into the Holy of Holies. And back in the ancient days of the temple, when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, they would always tie a rope to his ankle just in case. Because he was going into an encounter with God. And who knows what could happen? Because if I remember correctly, the whole the space of the Holy of Holies from my trip to Israel yeah. is where there is tradition to say in this spot is where creation began. Yeah. And this spot is where God has been. Like God's direct, like if there were a conduit from God to earth, it's right here. Yeah, that's right what they used to think about the temple. This yeah. rock. This rock. This yep. whole, this first temple, this temple. Yep. Right here. Yep. And right. so the priest is going to go into the most, if there is one, although we just discussed the song, God is everywhere. But yeah, right, right. if he's anywhere, he is most especially <laughs> right here. And so the need of that fear and tremble and awe of being in the, even in the space where God has been, that the need to you know, tie a rope around my ankle just in case something gets sucked in. Well, that's why, you know, it was never the same priest every year who went in. They would draw lots to see who, who had to risk it. You know, and if you'd, risk, if you'd already been in, you weren't part of the lot drawing. You, you're opted out. Because you don't have to, you never go back a second time. You're you just, only go in once. I only have to be tribute once. Yep. And so they draw lots for, to see who goes in. And the, the person goes in, makes sacrifices for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. And hopefully they get to walk out again. <laughs> so I said to Victoria, I said, that's what's really represented. It's standing at the altar and saying the Eucharist, are you ready to have the rope tied around your foot? And she said, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you know uh, any stories will. of people not making it out? What's that? Do you know of any stories of people not making it out? No. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. That's the amazing. Think about that for a minute. I mean, one of the best descriptions we have of that experience was Isaiah's um, vision in the temple in the sixth cha chapter of the book of Isaiah, how he saw the Lord um, raised up and his train filled the temple. And there were smoke and there was the fountains or the um, foundations of the threshold shook. You know, all this stuff happened. And even Isaiah, when he had that incredible experience, he came out. Yeah. But 600 years later, 600 years later, they're still going in thinking, it might not, we might not make it out this time. <laughs> they this still got time that all. This could be the time. <laughs> this could be the time. <laughs> no, we have no stories of people who didn't make it out. <laughs> Curious. I suddenly was like, wait, who, what, what, who's the one that didn't make it out? 
Even Jeremiah doesn't say that somebody got <laughs> blown up in the Holy of Holies and never made it out. And he's pretty dismal about things. <laughs> All right, so one last question. Although many of us are not able to gather for worship right now due to social distancing orders, this is a good time for us to think about what you expect to happen regarding the assembled in God's presence when such gatherings are again permitted. Will that time of gathered worship be substantially different in any way from being with others um, in say like Walmart or Home Depot? We can only hope. <laughs> Bring your well, I think awe it's and less wonder. transactional. <laughs> like, <laughs> although we do, I mean, if you're going to make the link to worship as the same thing as going to um, a mega box store like Walmart or Home Depot, um, I wonder, like, you were going in search of something, right? Like, let me rephrase that. I only go to Walmart or Home Depot if I absolutely have to. This is not a fun outing for me. Um, I am going for something specific that I can only get there. There's a specific commodity that only they can offer me. Um, and so you're expecting something transactional. I'm expecting that I'm going to you know, give you my money and I'm going to get what I need. Um, and that, so I wonder, um, that's a means and an end, right? Like this it has a specific need. And so I wonder about like how our worship and our awe opens us up to I'm coming and I don't know what I'm going to expect today. Yeah. Kind of like the blue light special from Kmart. You never knew. <laughs> Where that blue light would be. <laughs> hey, Robin, I just suddenly thought of the blue light special, right? <laughs> uh, but it's still transactional. And that's, that that's is still transactional. But I think of this idea, though, of, you know, that you come in and you come to worship and you have no idea what I'm going to get today, right? And I may not be, like, there are days, I, yes, I went to church on Sunday because it was obligational, right? Like, and, and some of our traditions do have days of obligation, right? You better be well, there. For us, it's our job. Yes. We gotta be there. But, but I mean, like you think of, you better be there for Easter. You better be there for Christmas. You better be there for, you know, there are certain high holy days that are days of obligation. Sure. Um, so, but you, but so there have been times where I've come on a Sunday. Yes, because it's my job, but even before it was my job that it's Sunday morning, I'm supposed to be at church. So I went and there are times where you go and you worship or you watch it online and you're like, well, okay, check. I did that this week. I did, you know, I did the service. And then there are other times I think where we go not expecting anything and are suddenly blown away by something that's said or the music or something happens that is truly awesome or awful or awesome. You're awestruck. Right. Um, and you didn't expect it. And so, um, and part of that awesomeness is just being, I think when we're able to gather again, it's part of just being in community that whether I'm going to get out of anything out of being here today, I'm here to support you in, in the body of Christ gathered and whatever the body needs today. And in a sense, that's the reason to go to church because you don't know what will happen. Yeah. You don't know what God will do. <laughs> And that was an amazing. ominous eyebrow raise. <laughs> we do not know what God will do. And so we come because we expect something, but we're not sure what it's going to be. Yeah. All right. So, well, the okay. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Awesome God, your word tells us to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. May our natural curiosity, wonder, and awe ever be pathways towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And remember, everyone, you can send us emails or texts or ask us or call us. This is not meant to be just a dialogue between the two of us. We invite your comments as well. Yeah. All right. See you later. God bless. Bye.